Kasperi Kapan has been known from the day he was drafted, and no, actually way before that when he was just a kid crawling around NHL locker rooms because his dad, Sammy, played in the league for such a long time. Young Kasperi and older Kasperi were always expected to score, score, score. So what is it that we're seeing from him right now? Good morning to you. Good Thursday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Penguins. Comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or baseball. I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Pirates that I hope you'll take the time to check out. It'll be Penguins versus Hurricanes again. Tonight at PPG Paints Arena, the Penguins will try to beat the Hurricanes for the first time in three meetings. The games have been somewhat close-ish, and yet they've not been able to get over the top, in large part because the Hurricanes come at you with wave after wave after wave of depth. A lot of it is unspectacular depth, but it's depth nonetheless. And for the Penguins' depth, to get... To that point, and by that I'm talking only about the third and fourth lines, I would take the Penguins' top lines, although Carolina's got a pretty good top line itself. You're going to need to see scoring from the Jeff Carter line, from the Teddy Bluger line. You're going to need consistent play over all 200 feet from both of those lines. And arguably the key to all of that is, is Kapanen, because he's the wild card. He's always been the wild card. He's an expensive wild card, since Ron Hextall agreed to pay him $6.4 million over two years, stunning probably everybody on the planet, including Kapanen, other than Hextall himself. But here we are lately, ever since Kapanen's gotten back into the lineup, he's contributed something offensively most every night. And I'm not even talking about the hat trick because he had one of those last season and then fell off. I'm talking about being visible, about being a tangible factor. I'm talking about what we saw from him, really, if you think about it, the other night in Raleigh in the most recent meeting with the Hurricanes. He didn't score, but he was all over the rink. And if you're watching the broadcast or listening on the radio, you heard his name constantly. This, I believe, is not a coincidence when paired up with seeing just a couple nights ago against the Rangers, Kapanen run up eight hits. Now, for those of you who go way back with the hit stat, you'll know that's like a Darius Kasparitis level of hits in a game. It's a ton. It's almost something that you generate by skating around looking for contact. Well, here's the funny thing about Kapanen right now. He might be doing exactly that. This portion of Daily Shot of Penguins is brought to you by the good people at the Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank, where they're committed to providing food for all of our neighbors in need across western Pennsylvania. They, in turn, need your help. Find out how $1 can be turned into five full meals. For those in need, visit pittsburghfoodbank.org. Now, I've yet to speak with anyone inside the organization to this, so what you're about to hear is more of an educated supposition than anything else. But Mike Sullivan has talked openly, uh, strikingly at times, about laying everything related to Kapanen on him. Sullivan will say things like, I need to be a better coach where he's concerned. I need to do better with this and that because he wants to put it on himself and take the onus off the kid. And the kid is, as some, I spent a lot of time with Kapanen and he's a, on one hand, really gregarious, outgoing, fun, exactly the dude that you'd expect to show up to the rink wearing a bright green suit. He does this, by the way. And at the same time, he's a tough nut to crack. As soon as things get serious, he he gets a little bit withdrawn. He starts looking away when you're talking to him. And maybe, maybe this reflects in his play. Because when you watch him, there's not really anything wrong with him. He doesn't come with a flaw. He's an elite shooter when he gets his release right. 
He's an elite passer, as he demonstrated with what undoubtedly was the pass of the year at PPG Paints Arena a few days ago. He's the fastest player on the roster. He's got terrific size for someone that fast. And he cares. He cares deeply. One of the greatest misnomers about Kapanen is that he drifts off because he's, uh, I don't know, lazy or a space cadet or entitled. or No, no, he doesn't have that in him. Believe you me, and I have a history of this, I'll call that out when I see it. That isn't the case here. Well, what is it? I think he just loses focus and he lacks direction and purpose on the ice. That's why Sullivan takes this particular challenge so personally, because he feels like he can address it if he can get the message through the right way. And what he's done to an extent is oversimplify things. When you cross the other team's blue line, Cappy, go to the net. Either you or the puck needs to end up at the net. There was a rush in the game against the Rangers the other night where Keandre Miller, the defenseman for New York, really good defenseman, lefty defenseman, was over on the left side, cutting off Kapanen as he'd attempted to gain the New York zone. Kapanen, in the past, 99 times out of 100, and you know what I'm about to say here, would do that pirouette thing and wait it out. This time, even though there was no play to be had on this front, he just flicked the puck from about 80 feet onto Igor Shesterkin because Miller was all over him. But the puck got there, and it looked very much like the kind of thing that would get forced upon you if things were being oversimplified for you. Watch Kapanen in other sequences, and you'll see that he is, in fact, hitting people. And if you go back to last season, which was an epic disappointment, I think we all can agree, including Kapanen himself, from a production standpoint, His advanced analytics as a possession guy, and thus as a defensive guy, were through the roof. He was really, really good in this regard. He was on the puck, and when there was a chance to win a 50-50 puck, he'd come out of there. Maybe because of his physical skills, maybe his want to, whatever it is, but he'd do it. Even when he'd go 10, 12, 20 games without scoring, he'd still have these good advanced analytics. And yet, you know, and I know he's not Dominic Simone. He could do a lot more. So what I think, and I'm going to reiterate, this is just what I think, is that Sullivan is getting him engaged in the oldest of old school ways, which is to tell him, you see a body? Go hit it. And what Kapanen's done and what he did in the Rangers game upon a second review of this is... He's hit, but he's hit with a purpose. He's hit to get the puck. He's not hitting just to be Matthew Barnaby. He's hitting so that he can maintain or acquire possession of the puck. And if Sullivan's on to something here and it results in more scoring. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. But still, right? When we come back, J1Q. W. Kowalski, who asks, what was the secret of the penalty killing turning it around of late? Teddy Bluger's return, new guys, Ryan Paling, Josh Archibald gelling, or something else. Some were pretty gloom and doom last year regarding the PK after Zach Aston Reese was traded that maybe he was the key guy. What does this say about him or the coaching? Well, there are a couple of things at play here, one of which I got to tell you isn't sustainable. But let me start with the main factor. Because who is it that the coaches invariably say has to be your best penalty killer? Right, the goaltender. So oftentimes, uh, PK stats can be guided just by the performance of the guy in the very back. And of course, Tristan Jari with a 13-game point streak 
at 11 0 and 2 is being counted upon to make some significant saves and has done so to his credit. So I could start and end my answer there, but I won't because I do think there's been more to it. Uh, we also tend to look a lot at the forwards when we do that. And you did it yourself and I've done it because those are the guys that we identify as the penalty killers because that's when they're utilized in a special team situation. Whereas the defensemen are probably the bigger deal. Chris Letang, I think, has really elevated his game on the PK. I've loved the work of Marcus Pedersen there. And while Jeff Petrie uh, isn't with the team now, Petrie was a big part of the PK's turnaround, I thought. He was doing some things uh, on the back line that were better than pretty much anybody else uh, when it came to that. That said, and this is the part that's not sustainable that you have to be careful of, because ever since some of the fourth line guys, now both Paling and Archibald, have been out, Mike Sullivan's been forced to use Brian Rust as a PK guy. Sullivan has made clear that he'd rather not use Rust because there's a risk of injury and because the top six at even strength matters a lot more than your PK does. But Rust is there now, and Rust, as Sullivan is wont to say, without being one who's uh, prone to hyperbole, is elite at penalty killing. His, his ability to read the play, to study the opposition's power play, to know when and where to be, and then from there to clear, is through the roof. He's right. That might be something that you'd revisit when it comes to playoff time because you'll want to have your best PK guys out there. But I do uh, both respect and appreciate that Sullivan wouldn't want to do that with Rust over 82 games. It doesn't make sense. They're going to make the playoffs. You've got to do some things to make sure that you're not beating your best guys into the ground. My guess is that if Sullivan wanted to, he could take any number of his top six forwards, arguably all of them, yes, even Gino, and turn them into great PK guys. But you don't want to do that. It does not benefit the team over the long run. So I didn't really answer your question other than to say that Jari's been really good, but they have tightened up. They have become, well, when I say tightened up, if I say literally It'll do a better job of explaining it. The Penguins play a compact box. Uh, They don't do a whole lot of reaching out. They don't get aggressive. They're not uh, the Flyers that we've seen do that. The Dallas Stars, by the way, were super aggressive when we saw them in here last week with extending out of the box to try to force you to make a play. It's usually a mistake against Pittsburgh's power play, by the way. The Penguins are are conservative. They're they're in that little rectangle, and they don't move out until they see something going wrong, until they sense something going wrong, meaning with the other guys, at which point they'll go after them. They've been very, very disciplined in this sense. But again, this starts with the goaltending and the defense. I appreciate everyone listening to Daily Shot of Penguins. We'll do another one tomorrow. (laughs) 